I do the same thing. You know, I come from a very poor background, and uh -huh. we had no money for food at times, quite literally, and uh, it was it was rough. So I I want to make sure money wasn't a you know an issue for my future family. So I figured how to make money, and I figured when I was I don't know 23, I figured how to make a million dollars in a year. I went from 38,000 to a million, and you don't do that by some new strategy. It was a psychological shift as well as a strategy shift. Right. But then I made the same amount of money for seven straight years, even though I built a dozen more companies, I helped more people than ever. But it was like unconsciously, well, you want more than a million dollars? What are you, you know, are you greedy? <laughs> and and I, was at, I was actually staying, where was I? I was in, um, I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I uh -huh. arrived at two o'clock in the morning on my birthday. I didn't have a private plane, so I had to go like four different connections from where I was. <laughs> and I get in this place, and it's a horrible place. And I call my kids, and I'm talking to this woman on the phone named Maria, who used to run my house and take care of my kids. I said, you know, Maria, I'm sorry it's so late, but I want to talk to my kids. Oh, happy birthday. She gives me this whole thing. And then she walks me to Mr. Robbins, you know. She says, I never dreamed I'd live in a castle because I had a place called the Dollar <laughs> Castle. And I, and I just want to thank you. I feel like a princess. She goes, uh -huh. last night I was sitting in your jacuzzi looking out at the water and thinking how lucky I am. And I'm in the Ramada Inn in those days <laughs> looking at this moose head going, this woman is really rich. So I finally decided, listen, if I can make, a, you know, 38000 a million, it's not about money. It's like growth. So mm -hmm. I went, you know, I want to make $3 million, but I want to make more of it while I sleep. And, but then I really began to realize it doesn't matter how much money you make. Mm. It's really your capacity to take your creativity and stop trading time for money. It's the worst trade in the world. Everybody's a financial trader. Yeah. They don't realize they're a trader. They're trading time. And you can't get more time. So right. this book is how to take anybody, an average person, a millennial just getting out of college with a bunch of debt and saying, how do I really make this work? Or a baby boomer saying, how do I still retire? Mm -hmm. And the way I did it was I said, I want to interview 50 of the most brilliant financial people in the world. Because most people don't know that mm. I've... I've been working with Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 financial traders in history, for 21 straight years. And he hasn't lost money in one year in 21 years. Right. We made money in the, the tech blow, you know, blow up that happened in 2000 and 9 11. In 2008, when the market was down 51% from top to bottom, he made 28% positive. Right? Incredible. So every day, literally, he emails me, I monitor him, I come see him, I work with him. and. He pays me seven figures a year to be able to do this, and I've been able to continually help him go to the next level. But quite mm. frankly, I've learned more from him, I think, than I could ever teach him. Right. <laughs> and he helped me open these doors. So this book mm. is the best from every self-made billionaire that I could find. Carl Icahn, I mean, I'm sitting down with this guy. He just made $2 billion in the last 18 months off a $30 million investment off Netflix. He sent an email or a, a tweet out, a tweet out. And about <laughs> Apple saying it was undervalued and became, and two hours later, it was worth 17 billion more by a tweet. Wow. So the people I've got to hang with over the last three, four years have been, I've got a PhD in finance from the people controlling the world's finance. And what I've tried to do is the reason I did that is make it simple, bring it so I could train mm. anybody else. Because in this business, what you don't know will hurt you financially. So right. I want to know how to protect people and how to help people maximize. And that's right. why I did the book. It's, it's incredible. And what I want to know is why we weren't taught these things growing up. Me you know, too. <laughs> what, Tell me. Right? So if you were, if, if they were like, okay, Tony, we're giving you the... The key to the education system. Yeah. And how would you apply, what teachings would you apply into about finances? Learning about this, how to generate wealth as opposed to trading time for money, but really yeah. leveraging it and investing yes. it the right way. What would you start implementing? Well, the first thing you want to teach anybody, a, a child, a kid, anybody, is that you'll never earn your way to freedom. Mm. You just don't. You look around and you see, you know, Kurt Schilling, if you remember from Boston Red Sox, yeah. he made $100 million a year, he's broke, bankrupt. I asked Warren Buffett, I said, what made you the wealthiest man in the world? And he smiled and he said, three things. He said, living in America, it's great opportunities, having good genes, so I lived a long time. And he said, the last thing is compounded interest. Mm. And we all know about compound interest, but I, I give the example of the book of this guy, Theodore Johnson, worked for UPS, never made more than 14000 in income in his entire life in a year. And in old age, he was worth $70 million. And how did he do it? All he did was he took a percentage of his income. His percentage was 20%. Mm. Now, his family said, you can't, we can't save any money. But right. he met a friend who said, if you pretend there's a tax, and the tax just took the money away from you, and you never see it, the money just comes out of your account and goes in an investment account, you'll be financially free. And so he was disciplined. He didn't look at it. It happened. $70 million by compounding. So... People's mistake is, and kids don't know this, adults don't know this, that you won't earn your way there, but you can compound your way there. Yeah. What I want to do is say, where do you put that money? And not that's a trick, me. right? That's the like... secret. Well, the first trick is actually doing. Almost nobody does. Right. The second trick is you really have to understand where you're going to get hurt because mm. the fees. The fees are just destroy people. You, you have a whole right. chapter about the fees. I was like, this is incredible. Isn't it wild? It's nuts. Like, I mean, you lose I... so much money just on the fees. Well, just so people have an understanding, 96% of all mutual funds 
-hmm. never match the market. I mean, they never beat the market. Mm -hmm. So I was just on a mo morning show this morning, and um, and Michael Bloomberg's uh, one of his guys that has some of his money. So I'm, you know, this is the only industry I know of where people think they can be a doctor. They think they can be a financial planner. And I mm -hmm. said to him, I said, well, look, the statistics. Warren Buffett taught me this. He said Ray Dalio told me this. Uh, David Swenson, who took Yale from one billion to twenty-four billion mm -hmm. in two decades. These are people telling me this. Right. <laughs> nobody beats the market except a couple of unicorns that nobody has sure. access to. And I said, I didn't say you're not one of them. But I said, <laughs> here's the truth: ninety-six percent of mutual funds don't match the market. That means four percent succeed. Mm -hmm. Now, what are your chances of picking the right mutual fund? People don't know what they're doing. They put their money in a four hundred one k. They pick wow. a mutual fund not knowing what it is. If you play blackjack. And you and I play, and you get two face cards, and your inner idiot says, hit me. I want to. I want to give <laughs> one chance in a million. I'm going to You have an 8% right. chance of winning. Right. If you try to get a mutual fund, you got the 4% chance of winning. So what I show people is not only do you not get the result, mm. thinking logically, if I hire someone else to do it, they'll do better than me. But in addition, you pay around 2,000% more than it's worth, meaning you get the same exact product, the same mm. stocks. If you own the index, right? you own a piece of all of America's yeah. best companies, Say the Vanguard 500 index, 500 top companies, that costs 0.17%, mm -hmm. like less than two tenths of a percent versus the average mutual fund is 3.17. Incredible. <laughs> so you compound, 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 compound over, over time. time. But, but first, just hear that so you understand. <clears throat> it's like if you, the average car sold in America is a Honda Civic, it's $20,000. You can get the Honda Civic for $20,000, or you can pay $350,000. That's the difference between 0.17 wow. and 3.17. But if you look at it over a period of like, how old are you? 31. 31, okay. So let's assume you and a couple of buddies at 35 managed to put aside 100 grand, and you manage not to add any more money, but to grow it at 7% in spite of ups and downs in the market. And you're 65, how much money do you have? Well, if you paid 1% in fees over those 30 years, your 100 grand became 574,000 bucks. Not bad for never adding another dime. Right. If you had 3% in fees, had the same growth, but 3% in fees, you now have three hundred oh, and twenty-four thousand, almost, almost half as much, quarter million dollars, seventy-seven percent oh, less money, and wow. and you had the same return. It was just the fees. So the world, most people you ask them, what are your fees? They have no clue. Right. So I've created a site where people can go. They can type it in. You find exactly what your fees are right. and what you should be paying. And it just it's highway robbery. Where in the world would you pay two thousand dollars, two thousand percent more for the same exact product? You can only do it mm. because the financial industry makes things so opaque, so convoluted. And people feel overwhelmed. And hard to understand. It's Very like, understand. That's why I try to come in here and go, look, time to become the chess player, not yes. the chess piece. Yeah. Let me teach you so you understand what's going on. It's not that complex. They use all mm -hmm. these big words. Yeah. But when you know what's going on, you don't get screwed. And more importantly, you take advantage of the system instead of letting the system take advantage of you. Yeah, I like that. Now, you've coached some of the world's greatest athletes, yes. former presidents, yes. biggest CEOs. Who, who coaches you? I've, I've had a lot of people asking me to ask you this question. Yeah. Who mentors I, you, who coaches you today? I, I have always looked for people that were playing the game at a different level than I am and or, or knew the road ahead. Mm. I always tell people, um, anticipation is power. If you ever play a video game against a child, it's pretty disastrous, right? Maybe <laughs> not for you, you're maybe a different generation. But for me, it's like, you know, it's not the kid is faster and smarter. If they played this game before, yeah. like eight million times. So they know the first shot's here, the second shot's right. here, the third shot there, and you're like reacting. So. When you're reacting to things, you fail. So my mentors have been people over the year, different people. My earliest mentor was a man named Jim Rohn. Yep. He was a personal development speaker, just touched my life. Then I was involved in neurolinguistic programming, NLP, when I was, gosh, 21, 22, 23 years old. I became partners with a man named John Grinder, brilliant man, co-founder mm. of that. But in my last couple decades, it's been people like Peter Guber, who's owns yeah. the, the LA Dodgers and, and owns uh, you know the, the Golden State Warriors NBA team. And he's just brilliant. He's got 52 Academy Award nominations. Yeah. So he's a mentor for me. Um, uh, Paul Tudor Jones, I coach, but also I'm coached by him because uh -huh. we get to pitch and catch. Um, and then, you know, I've got some people in my life that, you know, like Steve Wynn is a dear friend of mine, built, yeah. built most yeah, of Las he's, Vegas. He's brilliant. And these guys are all 18 years my senior, so they know the road ahead. And I'm able to learn from them in advance and then kind of anticipate things. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is incredibly valuable. Yeah, very cool. Now, I want to ask you how you personally handle a breakdown. Because yeah. you, I've been to your, your workshop. Yeah and uh, incredible experience. Thank you. And you teach people how, how to overcome their fears and how to yeah. handle breakdowns, but yeah. how do you personally deal with it? And do you even have any breakdowns? Yeah, I, I, they sent me a list of questions you had just to kind of give me a <laughs> That was one of the questions and I was like, you know, it's interesting. It, it's breakdowns, it's certainly not something I experienced, but it's not because I'm so talented or so mm -hmm. brilliant or so fearless. It's just, you're like an athlete. You're an athlete. Yeah. You're in shape, yeah. right? You're not going to have a reaction in your body like somebody who doesn't take care of themselves. Right. So. 
you know, I believe I don't believe in emotional intelligence. I think it's useful, but I'm mm. more interested in emotional fitness because mm. intelligence is a capability. Fitness is a state of readiness. Interesting. If you are fit, you can take that demand right now and you can deal with it. You can deal with that physical stress, that emotional stress. Same thing's true with psychological fitness, emotional fitness, right? So I'm, I'm pretty fit. And part of that is not because I'm so smart. Part of it is I, I've taught this for decades. Yeah. I remember I had a woman who came to one of my seminars in, um, in her, I don't know, early 80s probably. And she would run in this room, five, 10,000 people. I think it was, you know, she went a couple of 10,000 person events. And she would get in this front row, fight her way through there. And she'd jump and go for it. And one break, she came up to me, I was signing a book for her, and she says, uh, she goes, Mr. Robbins, I've seen you at like eight of these. She goes, <laughs> I've seen you like when you're really, I know, I can hear your voice, uh -huh. you're hurting, or you haven't slept. And she goes, you always seem to be so up all the time. How come right. you're so up? And I said, well, part of it is I attend all these seminars. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I'm teaching it. So I, there's a fitness of that. But there's also, you know, I've, I've buried three fathers and, and one mother, and, you know, mm. that affects your life. I've, uh, you know, I've had a physician look me in the eye and say, you have a tumor in your brain. Wow. And so I've had those moments that when you've had extreme stress and you push your way through it, you build psychological muscle. Yeah. It's like it takes a lot to knock me off. You know, in the early days, we didn't have $50,000 to keep the doors open. How do we do it? Then I had, you know, graduated to $5 million. Then I graduated to uh, a partner that of mine who kind of didn't do things well, and I ended up owning $100 million because I had to take on his debts. Uh -huh. $100 million. And, but when you do all that stuff, you know, now my companies do $5 billion, you know, right. a year. So uh, you, you, you keep expanding what I would call really the circle of your, th the threshold of your influence. Sure. You know, everybody has a threshold of control. And if you get beyond it, you kind of freak out. So it, it takes a little bit more. I don't have, I can't so you don't only have breakdowns. I don't have a breakdown. I mean, do I get pissed off or get frustrated <laughs> or tired? Yeah, but a breakdown, honestly, no. So, so how do you handle it if you get tired or something? I sleep <laughs> when I can. Okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, it's honestly, it's pretty simple. But, you know, when I've, when I've had uh, challenging times, I mean, I have so many tools. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, doesn't I, happen. I, I pull them out. It's, and mostly, it's, so it's like you as an athlete. You know, you don't just physically break down. Right. right? You take care of yourself. So You're constantly I think, training that I think most people don't train their mind and emotions. It's like, mm -hmm. I think... The most powerful muscles to me are not physical, they're as strong as important as they are. It's like faith is a muscle, courage yeah. is a muscle, determination is a muscle, playfulness mm -hmm. is a muscle. You know, passion unexpressed weakens. You know, faith untested gets smaller. Yeah. So uh, I'm always, I, I call it deep practice. I'm always pushing myself to the edge, yeah. and pushing yourself to the edge makes you stronger. Yeah. You know? In the book, uh, I was really excited to hear you talk about, you say the, um, Secret to wealth is gratitude. Somewhere yes. in the book it says that. Yes. And I think maybe it was someone else you were referencing. Yes, it, it came from Sir John Templeton. And every day I practice gratitude. When oh, I wake wonderful. up and every night, I always try to say to my girlfriend or someone I'm talking to before I go to sleep, yeah. three things I'm most grateful for. That's great. Now why, so I was, I was pleased to see that. I was like, I'm on the right track if I'm living yeah. in gratitude, but why is that the secret to wealth? Well, uh, Sir John Templeton is probably one of the greatest investors in history. He, people don't know his name. Uh, he started out with nothing. Um, he wasn't Sir, he wasn't from another country, he came from the US. <laughs> and he decided that he wanted to understand wealth, and so he saved $10,000, a huge amount of money in those days. Uh -huh. And when Hitler invaded Poland, he developed a belief. And his belief was, you make your money in times of maximum pessimism. Like if you were around in 2008, really? eight, nine, you yeah. remember what it was like, right? Yeah. You could have bought you know, the Sands in Las Vegas, you could have bought their stock for $2.28, today it's $67. Wow. It's a 3,000% return. It's not bad. Um, you could have bought uh, Citibank for less than a buck, mm. right? So people in those times, he understood that, and so what he did was, and everybody thought the world was gonna end, he took $10,000, he bought every stock on New York Stock Exchange that was a dollar or less, including companies everybody thought were going bankrupt. But we, when things are bad, people think it's gonna be bad forever. When right. things are good, they think it's gonna be good forever. Mm -hmm. And they're always wrong, life's cyclical. So there's a season for everything. So mm -hmm. once we got through World War II and a few years later, guess what? Those same stocks made him a billionaire. So when I asked wow. him, I said, what's the secret to wealth? His response really touched me. He goes, you know it. You teach it. I said, what's that? He said, gratitude. And I said, why do you say that? He said, because if you got a billion dollars and every day you live pissed off and frustrated, the quality of your life is called pissed off and frustrated. <laughs> right. But if you have nothing but you're euphorically grateful for whatever you have, you're the richest person that you're going to know. He mm. said, so it doesn't matter how much money you got if you don't have gratitude. So I do the same thing, by the way. I have a process I call it priming, where I get up every mm. morning. I do mine in the morning. I just radical change to my body, kind of alter my state. And then I do 10 minutes I never miss. And my first three and a half minutes is what I'm really grateful for. And I make myself think of at least one of those three that's something really simplistic. Yeah. Instead of something giant. You know, the wind right. on my face, the yeah. look in one of my kid's eyes, you know, something of that nature. 
And then I do three minutes of strength and healing, and I do three minutes of when I'm going to create my world. And I do that for a minimum of 10 minutes yeah. every day because I believe you have to condition it. You don't just mm -hmm. hope that stuff shows up. You set your intention each morning. Well, no, no, every day. Yeah, every very day. cool. So what are you most grateful for recently in your life? Oh, so many things. Um, well, it's Thanksgiving, so one piece. Well, one is my, my daughter is 40 years old, and she's, she's been wow. a child forever, and she's going to bring me a grandson. Wow. A few months, which is kind of cool. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's cool. Um, <laughs> but also, it's Thanksgiving, so for me, it's a very emotional time because my family was fed when I was 11, and we had no food at Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and uh, it touched me so deeply, and I decided I was going to give back. So when I was 17, I fed two families, and then four, and then eight, and then I didn't tell me I was doing mm -hmm. it, and then I got my friends to do it, and my companies grew, and... You know, I've fed 42 million people now over mm. 37 years. And, uh, but you have a challenge doing, for this, right? Yeah, well, this one, I, what I did is I decided, you know, I'm writing this book, and in the middle of writing it, last summer, most people didn't even notice, Congress cut food stamps. They don't call yeah. them food stamps anymore, but I lived on them, so I know what they are, food stamps, right. with my family. My family lived on them. But they cut it by $8.7 mm. which means you eliminate 2 million people from the rolls overnight, and they still need to eat. Wow. So I support all these nonprofit organizations, and Feeding America is the largest in the country. And so I thought, I'm going to call attention to this. So if I donated all the profits of this book in advance, how many people could I feed? Because I normally feed $2 million through my foundation, and I match it. So right. we feed $4 million a year. And uh, they said you could feed 10 million people. I was like, wow. I mean, wow. <laughs> and, then, and then as the years gone by, I've gotten more and more inspired. And so now I'm going to feed 50 million people personally. I'm not just from the book. I'm writing a larger check on top of it. But also, I'm working with Feeding America to get matching funds to feed 100 million people. Incredible. So to go from my family not being able to eat to feeding 100 million people is a pretty amazing sense of gratitude and a mm -hmm. sense of grace. And yeah. I've done my part, but there's been grace in that as well. It's amazing. It's, it's incredible what you're doing and very inspiring. So thank you for, thank you. for doing that. So anybody who gets a book, <laughs> you're feeding I'm not getting providence for you, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it also feed on the average 50 families yeah. every book. 100% is being done. 100%. 100%. No, no, 100%. More, more than, than 100%. that. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, I think I also read in the book, I don't know if you said this or someone else said this, yeah. but the key to living is giving. Yes. Now, I think I might have heard you say this actually back when I first saw you when I was 16 at an yeah. event. And um, I remember thinking, I don't have anything to give. I don't have any money. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, How am I supposed to invest my money, yeah. 10, 20% every month, and yeah. then how can I give on top of that? Yeah. But I really understood that you know, it's so valuable and important to give, and I yeah. work with a lot of nonprofits myself, That's building wonderful. schools for kids around That's the world. Wonderful. And uh, I've seen a big impact in my life the way well, I'm able to serve people. Sir John Templeton told me that uh, he's never seen anyone tithe, which, you know, tithing is usually 10% of mm -hmm. what you earn, for at least a decade who didn't become incredibly financially free. Wow. And I think the reason is, uh, I had a moment, like, when my whole life changed. It was, it was kind of twofold. I had, I was, I was really young, like yourself back then, right? Working my tail off, trying to build a business. I mean, yeah. you had big goals, you know, yeah. you don't always succeed to start with. Right, it right. just come together, <laughs> right? You know, it was hard. And I remember I was so frustrated because I was working 18 hour days and nothing was working and I was broke and I felt embarrassed, you know, mm. I should be doing better than this. Sure. And so I was driving home from Orange County on the 57th freeway in, in San Gabriel Valley out near a place in Pomona, California. It probably uh -huh. doesn't matter anybody else, but I remember it so vividly because uh -huh. it was almost midnight. And I was at this breaking point and then I was like, why am I not, you know, doing better? And then I just pulled over the road and I used to keep these journals, I still have them, written journals. And I wrote in big lines, you know, the secret to living is giving. Mm. And I started to cry. And I realized, I am so focused on what am I not getting. Receiving. I'm not focusing on what I'm giving. Yeah. So for six months, man, it, it turned me around. But then, you know, something else to get in your body. It was in my head. It was in my heart. But it had uh, to get in there yeah. to stay. And I started going through some really tough times. And I lost everything financially. Mm. And I was mad at everybody because, like, I loaned a friend a thousand bucks. And, you know, I'd been doing well. And he, he didn't even return my phone call. Oh. And what changed me was I, I was down to, I don't know, 22, 23 bucks, something like that. I don't know, it was 24 dollars. Enough that I knew that I didn't have money for food for the next week, clearly. <laughs> right. And I didn't have any prospects. And I was living in Venice in this 400 square foot bachelor apartment, feeling sorry for myself, getting pissed <laughs> off. And I thought, you know what? I got to eat. So I'm not going to drive my car because I'm not going to spend the gas. I'm not going to pay for parking. Sure. I'm going to go to an all you can eat place and load up for the winter, right? So I can get more, like one meal a day. Right. And so uh, in, there's a place called Marina del Rey, not far mm -hmm. from Venice. And it's a beautiful community, and it's Very right good. on the water. And there's a place called El Torito. It's still there. It's a little uh, uh, restaurant. It had taco bar and all that kind of stuff. So I walked there for the three miles, and I go, okay, I'm going to go ahead and load up. And I was all about myself and getting through this. And this little... Well, this woman walked the door, actually a very attractive lady. That's probably why I caught my attention. <laughs> and I'm waiting to see who her boyfriend is, and there's nobody up there. There's a little guy down here. 
It was obviously her son. And he's wearing this three-piece suit, you know, a little vest. He opens the door for her. He pulls out the chair for her. And it was just, he stared into his mother's eyes. I mean, it was just pierced into her eyes. I, I don't know what it was, but something about him was just so moving. He was such a sweet, caring, loving young man. It was mm. mother that moved me. So I, I paid for my meal. I don't know what was left, 17, 18 bucks. I put it back in my pocket, was left. Walked up to this young man, introduced myself. And I said, hi, I don't remember his name. I think he said his name was Ronnie. And I said, Ronnie, I said, uh, I said, you're really, I said, you're a class actor. I saw how you opened the door for your lady. I saw how you held out the chair for your lady. He goes, she's my mom. <laughs> I said, that's even more classy. Right. And, I, and, he, and I said, so cool that you're taking her out to lunch like this. And he goes, well, I'm not really taking a lunch because I'm just 11 and I don't, I don't have a job, you know. Right. I said, yes, you are. And I had no plan. I literally I just reached in my pocket, took all the money I had, changed dollar bills, and wow. threw it right there in front of him. He looked at me like this. He goes, I can't take that. I said, sure you can. He said, well, why? I said, because I'm bigger than you are. Right? <laughs> and he got this big grin in his face. His eyes got this big. And I didn't, I just shook his hand. I didn't even look at this, his mom. And, and I just walked out the door. But the reason I tell you the story is I had no car. I had no money. Mm. I did not, I was euphoric. I was like flying home. I mean, it was like, you know, I probably looked like an idiot, probably skipping or something. I mean, I was just, <laughs> I, and what I felt was I should have been like, oh. what the hell did you just do? I have no meal or I wasn't going to eat. Right. I went home that night. I laid out a plan. And the plan was going to take me, you know, 10 days, two weeks. So I thought, well, people fast for a week. I could fast mm, for a week, you right, know, that right. type of thing. And I was in this great mindset about it. And I woke up the next morning, and I get the old regular snail mail shows up. And it's this guy I've called a zillion times. He wouldn't return my call. I open it up. There's a check, 1000 bucks wow. plus interest and an apology. Wow. So I'm sitting there, and I, and I started to cry, honestly. And I was just like, why did this happen, you know? And mm. I, I don't know if it's true, but I decided that day this happened because I did the right thing. Because I didn't have a plan, it wasn't a strategy. I just thought this little soul beside me, I knew it was right, and I did right. it. And I didn't do it because I thought I could or I couldn't. I didn't even think about it. And that's the day I became a wealthy man because I wow. didn't have any money, but scarcity left my body. And I have plenty of ups and downs since that time and various times in my life, but I never went back to that, oh my God, you know, how's okay, it going to happen? Yeah. It's like breathing. Do you stop and say, God, is there going to be any air before you take a breath? You right. know it's going to be there. Right. You, know, you don't you don't run your life by that right. aspect. And so that to me is what it's about, is showing people, if you won't give a dime out of a dollar, don't bullshit yourself. You'll never give a million out of 10 million or right. 10 million out of 100 million. It's right. just not going to happen. Right. But if you can do that now, you you don't ever get beyond scarcity. You start behind it. You, you, you make a decision to get beyond it. So how does someone, you know, when they're living in scarcity, they're living in fear, yeah. and it's like this emotional feeling, it's in your body, like yeah. you say, when yeah. you're like, I can't even pay for my meal, how yeah. am I gonna like start giving? What are some things that people can do to start overcoming that mindset or start strengthening it or shifting yeah. it? So I'll, tell you a couple I'll, I'll tell you what I did when I was first on my own. You know, I got my dad, my mom kicked my dad out when I was 17. She's very powerful on my <laughs> four fathers, so they all learned how to get the boot. She thought I was on his side, so she kicked me out next. I was 17. Uh -huh. She chased me out with a knife. She wouldn't have hurt me, but I wasn't going back in the room. Wow. And, um, and so I had to figure out what to do. And I didn't place to stay, and you know, I didn't stay in somebody's laundry room for a while, and then I started reading and feeding my mind, and then I developed this little system, and the system was really simple, and I, so I tell people now, as I say, number one, every single day, you got to feed and strengthen your mind. Mm. Until you do that, you're always going to be in fear. Because fear is oh, yeah. automatic. The human brain is designed for survival. It's not designed for success. Your right. brain is not designed to make you happy. That's your job. Right. And the only way you're going to do it is if you feed your mind. Because otherwise, weeds grow automatically. My, my coach, my mentor, Jim Rohn, used to tell me, he said, Tony, every day got to stand guard at the door of your mind. you got to mm. watch what's going in. Because if you're not careful, stuff will go in. And he said, not all the times it's somebody who cares about you. He said, you know, if you're... Your family. Yeah, yeah if your worst enemy yeah. puts sugar in your coffee, he said, what happens? I said, you got sweet coffee. He goes, what if your best friend by accident or your family don't mean to? They drop one drop of strychnine in your coffee. You're dead. He mm. said, so life, sugar, and strychnine and watch a coffee. Right, right. right. So <laughs> every day I decided, I, I, I'm old enough, honestly, there was no internet those days. And pretty ancient, I used to go to the library because it's the only place you wow. go. And I would feed, I read biographies, I mm. read people's lives, and it would make me go, wait a second, as bad as I think it is, the greatest people in the world had it worse. Sure. So there's something here. So you feed your mind. I, I'm, Jim Rohn used to say to me, skip a meal, but don't skip reading. He said, read mm. 30 minutes a day, I don't give a damn what it wow. is. And today, I don't mean internet crap. I mean, read something, that, a biography, read something mm. that's a strategy, read something that's going to change your life. And the second thing I tell people is feeding your mind's great, but you've got to also strengthen your body. Mm. And you do that as an athlete yeah. naturally. I learned to do that because fear is physical, mm. right? You know where you feel it. And if you go work out, if you go lift, if you go run, even if you're out of shape, you just go for an intense <clears> walk, that experience alone changes you. Like every day of my life, the first thing I do before I do my priming 
I have, if I'm at one of my homes, I jump in some hot water for fun, and then I jump in freezing water. And I have you know a river, you know, and one of my homes in Sun Valley, and I've got cold plunges everywhere else. So I go in 57 degree right. water, <laughs> boom. And what it does is like it's teaching my brain. I do. I tell my brain what to do, and it does it. Mm. It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't want to do it. And every cell <laughs> in your body is alive, right? So it doesn't have to be like two hours worth of something. It could be something right. you do for 30 seconds, but it's training your body to be strong. Because a mm -hmm. strong body could strong mind and vice versa. Yeah. The third thing I tell people is find a role model. You know, it, it seems impossible until you see somebody's done it. So, yeah. you know, Ray Dalio is one of the greatest investors in history. The guy was a caddy, right? You know, his dad was a jazz musician. His mom was a homemaker. Right. Um, you know, he's worth fourteen billion dollars. He How found, he he found someone to mentor him. He found well, he found multiple people to, right. to model. Right, right. right. You, you don't always find a mentor, but you find somebody you can model. And when you start seeing that somebody else can do it, and you see they really did, mm -hmm. you start to believe, you start to get certainty. And then the fourth thing I tell people is it's massive action and constantly change your approach. And then it's find somebody worse off than you are and help them. Because mm -hmm. when you do that, it gets you out of yourself. And, yeah. and that's what I, I really have people do. That's what we do at Thanksgiving. We have our basket yeah. brigade where two million people get fed. Amazing. Uh, not the one I do, the one that I, I get people to do. Yeah. And it's amazing. People go in there and they see, my God, I thought my life was tough, but look at this person's life. It makes you appreciative. It puts yeah. life in perspective. Yeah, very cool. Now, talking about feeding the mind, yes. uh, if you could only leave three books behind, it's the to, end of your life, who? <laughs> three books behind to your, to your kids. Yes. And, uh, or the, you know, the message to, your, to the world of like, here's the three most important books that Gosh. you should read. That's tough. What are those three books that <laughs> All the want? books I've read through. <laughs> you can only oh pick three. <laughs> That's a tough one. I, I don't know if I can do that, but I'll, I'll tell three off the top of my head. I'd okay. say Man's Search for Meaning, uh -huh. of Viktor Frankl, um, because all of us in our lives are going to experience extreme stress. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much money you have, I don't care how much people love or respect you, you'll have your time. It might yeah. be a health issue in your family, it might be something happens to the economy, it just, something happens to all of us. And so to see how people that were put in the most insane, unjust environment, people that were in Auschwitz, how they dealt with that unbelievable situation and how the ones that thrived in spite mm -hmm. of it, and to go through Viktor Frankl's way of understanding how to create meaning in your life, I don't think there's a, a more important book. I think maybe another mm -hmm. one might be As a Man Thinketh, uh -huh. because it's a book that you can read dozens of times in your life. It's small, and it's the core of everything. As you think, so you are. I mean, obviously, the Bible is an extraordinary book, or whatever religious document a person believes. I, I'm personally a Christian, but I tell people, whatever you believe, mm. you need to practice it, whatever it is, because right. um, there are many different ways of connecting you know, to, to what has created us. And then um, that's three already, but I'll give you one more. I think another one that's important <laughs> would be... Um, Understanding the life cycles of humanity. Mm. There's a book called Generations. It's a big book. It's, I think, a thousand pages, 800 pages. Bigger than this book. I'm much bigger <laughs> than this book. Uh, but it's a book worth reading because it shows you how, as every 100 years, 1800 years, we run through the same cycles. Like what mm. we've just gone through economically in 2008 yeah. happened 80 years before. And, and you can go through a thousand years of Roman history and you mm. see it. And when you begin to be able to anticipate what's coming, you know how to take advantage of the season. Some people freeze yeah. to death in the winter. People that are prepared might snowboard or ski and have a good time. Right. So uh, it's a brilliant book, and it's by Strauss and Howe. It's worth okay. reading. Cool. All right. So those are four. I'm, I'm curious. Why didn't you recommend one of your books? Uh, I, I don't think I'm the best <laughs> book in history. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'd, I'd rather, I'd, frankly, I'd put someone in an event. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Events are incredible. This is a, uh, a question from your son. Yes. And uh, I said, is there any question you haven't asked your dad well, that you're still curious about? And he said, yeah. Uh, you know, he's pretty calm, actually. You know, he's a calm guy. He's not outrageous like you. <laughs> he's pretty outrageous. And he said, uh, he said um, you know, my dad does everything on such a big scale. Everything is big. Everything is huge, impactful. It's like the biggest it can be, the best it can be. Yeah. He said, but I wonder what's something small he's done that he's so proud of. Hmm. So is there something small you've done you know, an example was you giving just, money to, you know, that child was a great example of that. But is there something recently you've done that's so small that you're, like, really proud of? I, you know, a lot of people don't think proud is a good term. I think it actually mm. is. Um, ego is edging God out. That's when you make shit up to make yourself feel good. But yeah. I think if you've really done something, you know you have, and no one could take yeah. that from you. And so I'm proud of who I am as a man. I'm proud of... The things that, you know, what goes on when the camera's not on. Mm. And there are people around me all the time that will tell other people stories about what I'm really like. So I don't have to communicate that to people. It gets yeah. shared. So um, I don't know. I don't know if there's, there's so many things in life. I, I don't measure them as big versus small. Sure. My, my, my wife was somebody who would see one person and be thrilled. Mm. And I had to see, you know, 10,000. <laughs> I think so she's balanced it out for me. I still, I feel like life is short. 
And while you're here, I want to have the most impact that I can. So mm -hmm. I go deep and I go wide. Right. Um, but every interaction to me is an important interaction. Yeah. And, and sometimes that interaction is just being kind. I know it sounds yeah. stupid, but kindness can, to the right place at the right time, you know, somebody can be suicidal, you don't know, and you're being kind and, and changes right. their state. Yeah. There's a, it's an interesting story of, um, there's a gentleman who, who wanted to kill uh, Nixon. <clears throat> and he couldn't get access to Nixon. It's a true story. And so he became, he wrote a journal, that's how we know the details of it, and he decided he's gonna go after Wallace. And mm. he's gonna shoot Wallace. And he actually did do that shooting. And when they read his journal, it was fascinating. He didn't want to kill Nixon because he didn't like him or Wallace. He just wanted to be famous. Mm. He wanted to be worth something. And one of the reasons he didn't kill Nixon is he was going after Nixon and he was this far from the president and an old woman bumped into him just as he's reaching his pocket to get this gun. And in the middle of this, everything's frenzied. He wants to shoot, become the most famous man, you know, another one of those assassins. And this woman grabbed his hand and said, I'm so sorry. I'm just so, so sorry. Really? <laughs> and he said in his journal afterwards, his hand was on the gun. Wow. And her looking in his eyes with this love in her eyes and this kindness in her eyes, he said, I couldn't make her witness that. And he put the gun away. Oh, man. That saved Nixon's life. Wow. Right. So we didn't have to waltz, you know. But that's the power of a moment of kindness. So wow. I think we underestimate. Uh, you know, somebody came and fed my family when I was 11 years yeah. old, you know. Um, obviously, the person must not be alive still because I've told the story in these and last they 20 years. And they haven't reached out to me. Yeah. But, I mean, imagine what the impact of that was by that one little act of kindness. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, so you go back to 31. You're 31. Yeah. You're, my, you're my age. Yeah. What are the three things you do with your money based on the information in this book? You know, we talk a lot about asset lo uh, allocation. Yes. The fees, understanding where you're putting your money and understanding yeah. uh, finding a fiduci fiduciary, right? Yes, yes. We talk a lot about that, but what would you do if uh, you're making... Knowing what I know today? <laughs> yeah, go back, you're 31 yeah. years old, what would you be doing? Well, three, would, three things you'd do first. Uh, well, you have a good income, so we're talking about you, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. So you're making so, six to seven figures. Great, that's wonderful. Yeah. So what I would do in that range is I would take and I would model one of the best masters. If it was me, one of the people, asset allocation, so people are clear, mm -hmm. is the one thing that I met with uh, David Swenson. He took one billion, turned it into 24 billion mm. in, in two decades, in Amazing. 20 years. Just mind boggling, Amazing. a billion a year, right? Amazing. Just think about that level of doubling. It's just mind boggling. And I asked him, I said, what, what are the dials? What are the only mm. dials we can touch? And he said, Tony, to increase your return, there's only a few things you can do. He said, you can make better selections of stocks. He, he said, you can have better timing. He said, and you can have better asset allocation. He said, the first two will never happen because the first two cost you money. <laughs> Got to hire somebody, everybody's wrong on the timing. Uh -huh. He said asset allocation, which simply means dividing your money into different buckets. Some of those buckets are secure, mm. so that even though you think you're gonna be a genius, you're gonna make money no matter what, that money grows slower, but it'll always be there, and it'll give you freedom for the rest of your life. Mm. There's a growth bucket, which is also a risk bucket. We right. forget that, yeah. because one of the things Ray Dalio taught me, he said, Tony, everybody invests and what they think they know. So you grew up with real estate, you're not a genius, but you made money in real estate, because anybody can when real sure. estate's growing up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you think you're a genius. You think you know stocks. Oh, you're a genius you know, in, in 1999, right? Sure. You know, you're a genius in 2010 when things started to grow a bit. <laughs> he said, well, whatever you invest in, in your lifetime, that area is gonna drop 50 to 70%. There is mm. zero exception. He can show you mathematically and he can show you historically. Wow. So he said, you have to diversify even though you don't want to and you have to div divide these monies up. So every one of them taught me different asset allocations. But one, the one that I think is the most valuable for anybody to, to really take advantage of is Ray Dalio's because Ray Dalio's figured out, why is it in 2008, mm. if your stockbroker, your financial planner said, we're gonna protect you, we're gonna put you half in stocks and half in bonds, uh -huh. why did they both go down? Hmm. You weren't protected at all. Same thing happened in 2000. And he figured something out. When you think you're in a balanced portfolio, you're not balanced. And the reason is stocks are three times more volatile than you'll find in bonds. Mm. What does that mean? It means when you think you're 50-50, you're 50-50 with your money, but you're not 50-50 with your risk. You're 95% at risk and 5% wow. on the good side. That's why everybody loses. So he figured a formula because he said, look, someday I'm going to be gone. Yeah. I want my kids to have the money long term. I want you know, all the philanthropic things I'm doing to be taken care of. So he spent 15 years studying the markets and mm. figured out how do I design a portfolio that'll make money 
every time. Like, uh-huh. if it loses money, it lost in 75 years, it's lost 1.6% when it's lost, but it's been right 85% of the time. Wow. If you went to Vegas, and you had a plan that worked for 75 years, and made money 85% of the time, and when you lost, you lost 1.6%, and when you gained, you gained more than 10%. Uh-huh. The biggest loss in 75 years is 3.95%, less than four. Wow. So why do people not make it in the stock market? Because when you take a 50% hit, they all say stay in. Nobody, the, the average person never stays in. Sure. If you look at the last 20 years, the average person, the stock market over 20 years, from 1993 mm. to 2013, has averaged 9.2%. Pretty cool mm. compounding. Yeah. You double your money pretty damn quick doing that. Right. But the average mutual fund investors made 2.5%. Ooh. Why? Because they freak out, they sell when it goes down, they buy when it's looking good, which is the wrong time to buy uh-huh. it. They don't know what to do. So what Ray Dalio's strategy does, and, and by the way, he's never shared this strategy ever publicly. And he gives it in here. He gives it in yeah. here, which is mind-boggling. Cool. I pushed him, I teased him, I uh-huh. controlled him. In the end, I said, look, you're not taking any more money. Help the average guy out. Mm-hmm. He lays it out. You can do it yourself, or you yeah. can have someone else do it for you, but it takes 15 minutes a year and mm. 85% success over 75 years. Wow. And, and I can take any time period. The last 30 years, he lost money four times, one of those is 0.003%, so it's really wow. breaking. So, and, the, and again, the most you ever lost, less than 4%, average right. 1.9%. Right. So if you're looking for a plan, I put some money there. Then the other money that I would do is I'd take some of that money and I'd look at what are the biggest trends. Mm. I have a lot of my money also in senior housing. And the reason is twofold. Um, it's a demographic inevitability. There's this giant wave of baby boomers, and there isn't yeah. enough senior housing to take care yeah. of them. And I also, I like it. I like to create a quality place for someone to be able to be lived and taken care of and so forth. But there's huge income from it, and there's the growth in the asset itself. Sure. So I'd be looking at what are the big trends, but I would make sure I locked down a segment of my money that just, I, I took a percentage of my income no matter what, mm-hmm. and I made it really big, and I made it so I never have to work again. Sure. And, and that's where I am now. I don't have to work. And what's right. ironic is, when you interview people that make at least 750000 a year, right, just under a million, 80% of them say they'll never retire. Mm. When you interview people that make a very little amount of money, they all talk about wanting to retire. Right. And the people that do retire say they'll retire after 75. Like, you know, Steve Wynn's my buddy, he's 72. Warren Buffett's 80, what, four Still now. Still working. You know, uh, uh, you know, I met with Jack Bogle, who created Vanguard. Mm-hmm. He's been in the business 63 years. Wow. He's 85 years old and such a genius. Sitting down there, he spent four hours with me, by the way. Just wow. he's, uh, came by for 45 minutes. He wrote in, in the book here, he goes, Tony Robbins came by for 45 minutes. Four hours later, I had the most <laughs> provocative and probing interview of my life, he said. But, uh, but you know, the guy's still in the game. Because sure. the real goal is not to have to work. If mm-hmm. you don't work, you will start raving mad. Because mm-hmm. we all need to be productive to feel alive. Yeah, interesting. A couple questions left for you. Sure. One of them is, what's your definition of greatness? Mm. I don't know. I think everyone has greatness. I, I don't like that separation. I, I, I respect mm-hmm. it because in sports, I think it's really easy to measure. But sports is one aspect of life. Mm-hmm. You know, I think everyone has the opportunity to be great. To me, being great is being outstanding. To stand out from all the rest. And, and as you know, in sports, it can be by you know, a few microseconds, right? Yeah. You know, in the yeah. Olympics, you know, it could be a nose hair mm-hmm. and you stand out. If you stand out, you show other people what's possible. Mm-hmm. Not everybody likes that. Some people get angry and think you're showing them up. Other people get inspired. I've always been inspired by somebody who's the best in the world at what they do. Mm. And so I think greatness is somebody who just will not settle and finds a way to do, be, share, and create in life what they want, right. as opposed to fitting in. I think most people are trying to not be rejected. I, you know, I wrote in this book, I, you know, I took a, a quote from um, Aristotle saying, you know, how do you really live your life? Well, if you don't want to upset anybody, it's really simple. Don't do anything, don't say anything, <laughs> don't be anything, and everybody will yeah, like you. you yeah. know? But if you want to have a quality life, I think you just have to put yourself on the line. And mm. so to me, greatness is people that put themselves on the line, they keep growing, they won't settle. Mm. So what's next for you? Why are you still, what are you still up to? I mean, why are you going after inspiring <laughs> 100 million people, feeding 100 million people? What's next? Why not? Right? Sure. It's like, what else are you going to do with your life? I, I, <laughs> I look at, there are lots of challenges. I mean, this is a problem I wanted to go after. Mm-hmm. It's a problem because people are being abused by a system that mm. nobody means to abuse it. It's just, sure. uh, it's not an evil system. It's just you have large corporations that are set up to make a profit, and that's their job. Yeah. They're not set up to make you as an investor more profitable. Right. So they take care of their shareholder first. So they get all the fees they can, they manipulate the system. So I want to give people freedom. Mm. You know, To me, that's valuable. But you know, uh, what I do with my life is I look at what I see that moves me. I mean, I, I always tell people, People ask me about speaking. They say, you know, how do you be an effective speaker? I said, don't speak about shit you're not passionate about. <laughs> you know, and that you don't have a true right. 
true edge where you can help somebody. Yeah. If you can add massive value and you're passionate about it, then talk about it. Otherwise, shut the, you know what up? You know, that's my <laughs> view. So when I find things that I, I'm very passionate about, I like to go deep. I think we sure. live in a, you know, a Facebook world, a Twitter world, a tweeting world, texting world where people are, by technology, not realizing they're becoming more and more shallow. Mm. I mean, there are people ending relationships by texting now. Right. It's like, you know, it's right. just, are you kidding me? <laughs> they're thinking, why is the person upset? I can't understand. Did you see this? I texted you. <laughs> and I, I look at them going, are you kidding? But technology is making us think mm. that our Facebook friends are our friends. I mean, yeah. give me a break. There's only a few friends you can go deep with. You can't yeah. have 10,000 friends yeah. and go deep. And I think a lot of people are dissatisfied because technology is making us go faster and faster. So I look for things to go deep in. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in our lives, there's a few areas that matter. Your body, your emotions, your spirit, your relationships, mm -hmm. um, your economics, you know, your business. Those half dozen or so areas I like going deep in and I'm going to keep doing it. Sure.